Yeah. On the hips, it's a boy. All at the front, it's a girl. No, it's the other way. Other way round. It's the other On way. On the hips, it's a girl. <laughs> I was good at the time. By this point in his vice, that's a great start. I'm sure that's Rick Astley. Matt McGarden. Who have you got in? Rick Astley. There was, all the people go to the Chelsea Flower Show. Neil, do you remember St Bernard who wrote the rule? No. Neil, do you remember St Benedict? Who terrifying. <laughs> vacuum cleaner? Yeah. Little brush? Yes. Brushing? Vacuuming? Neil, this was in use for the last 30 years of old. Godric. Godric. Godric, you idiot. Godric. So I shall ask Kay Jones, what's off your needles? What? Kay Jones, what's on your needles? <laughs> Godric chose the site of his forever home well. Forever home well. Why can't I say that? Everybody to the Bakery Bears video show featuring the rise and fall of the monasteries. Yes. Was that big enough for you? Was it what? big enough? I felt like a thespian. I felt like I was delivering Hamlet. Oh, did you? But maybe like in a very Stewart, bad you know? way. Yeah, well, that would be Hamlet with Patrick Stewart. That I would suspect, be amazing. Would be stupendous. Yes. Now, what a visit we have in store for oh, you today. It's really lovely. And I don't just mean the show. I don't just mean no. the lovely what's on and what's off your needles. No. I'm talking about the priory that we're going to visit. Yes. For the first time this series, it's been Abbey's all the way. Yeah. But this is going to be our first priory. Yeah. And what a story it is because this priory was set up. By a pirate. Oh, he's really cool. Unbelievable, isn't it? Are you talking about, can I say his name? Yeah. Godric. Yeah. We, oh, yeah. I love him. Yeah. Dude. Oh, my goodness. Wait till you hear about Godric. You're going to just love him. I feel slightly disrespectful calling him a dude. That's a cool name. It is, yeah. Godric. Yeah. Godric Jones. Yeah. You see, that would have been good, wouldn't it? Yeah, Henry Jones all the way. Henry Jones. If we'd had a boy, he was going to be Henry. He was, and I was going to call him Indiana. Yes. Ugh. But then I didn't want a boy. I was convinced we, I was having a boy. Perfectly happy with the girl. But no, no, then then the then the birth predictor predicted correctly. You did? Yes, yes. Yeah. On the hips, it's a boy. All at the front, it's a girl. No, it's the other way. Other way round. It's the other on way. On the hips, it's a girl. <laughs> I was good at the time. <laughs> Dan's theory is if your bump is all at the front like this, it's a boy. Yes. If, you, if you're carrying it sort of all around you, that's a girl. And I, I didn't, I never had a huge bump really, did I? No. I didn't seem to. So his prediction was correct. Yes, in and it has case. been every time. I've never got it wrong. No, he, yeah. If yeah. you know anybody that needs a prediction yeah. on whether it's a girl or a boy, you don't need any of these gender reveal parties. Just don't get it the wrong way around just like I just down. did. Yeah, just don't get it the wrong way around. What are two weeks we've had, though? Oh, my good... Oh, oh! I forgot to mention. The best thing of all about today's rise and fall of the monasteries is the rain. Oh, it rained. It wasn't supposed to, was it? No, no. And I'm not saying that in a negative way. You said no, you loved it. I really liked it, because you can actually see the rain falling, you know, from the... You'll see from the drone shots. And also, when Dan's walking around, you can clearly <laughs> see it's raining. <laughs> I had to but it was really lovely. I loved seeing the drone in the air and the rain falling. Just watch out for it. It's really lovely. Stuart the drone. Mm -hmm. Oh, my heart feels warm when yeah. I think of him. Did a, he did a fabulous job and he didn't mind the rain. No, he didn't. Marvellous. Yeah. That's a song, actually. I just, oh, no, 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 but the, the song is I Just Can't Stand the Rain. Oh, yeah, So Stuart yeah. loves the rain. Is that like, who's... Is I that, Just Can't Stand the Rain yeah, Down My it, Window... Is it the fellow with the big hair? Leo, it's not Leo Sayer, is it? I don't know. Oh, I love Leo Sayer. I love Leo Sayer. Oh, I'm in the mood for dancing. He was dancing. epic. I was watching a bit of the Chelsea Flower Show this was morning. Was he on it? No, Rick oh. Astley was there. Oh. I was like, how random. Does he do gardens? I don't know. I was like, I'm sure that's Rick Astley. I'm my garden done. Who have you got in? Rick Astley. There was, all the people go to the Chelsea Flower Show. One year I want to go, I said to Dan, I'd love to go, but... Yeah, that was cool. Very random. But no, I wonder if it was Leo Sayer. We'll, we'll find out if I was right. <laughs> that, was a, that was such a huge leap from Leo, Leo Sayer, Sayer to, to Rick Astley. That's they're both pop singers. That's just how my to be brain honest, works, To that's clearly. totally cool. I would put Leo Sayer above Rick Astley. 
quite yeah, quite a I mean, long Rick way. Yeah, Rick Astley actually had his moment in time, didn't he? Yeah, in, in the late eighties, and that was it. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it really was just that one song that he was famous for, it was. wasn't it? But great. What are two weeks we've had though? Because there are times in life where things happen. I mean. Life is a rich tapestry, isn't it? Mm. We've all got stories to tell. There's ups and downs. And I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is they they think everyone else's life is perfect, don't they? You know, it, it's so easy it's, to... It's really difficult in this world of social media, isn't it, to not to look at people's lives. Yeah. I say lives in inverted commas because, as we know, on social media, people do like to present their... Personas? Yes. Quite often, that's not reality. In a way. Well... It isn't. And that's the great thing, you know, for everyone who's having a hard time today or any day, you know, when you look at it, and I think everyone does it. Surely it's human nature. You look around and you see don't you think, oh, my goodness, they're so lucky. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah. There's always a story to tell. There is. Because we're all humans at the end yeah, of the day. Yeah. And sometimes something happens to sort of put things in perspective. I mean, for us, you know, you're... Your birth stories, which we covered at length yeah. on the radio show. Bryony's birth, you yeah. mean, not my birth. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> that certainly put things in perspective for us at the time. Yeah, yeah. Dealing with cancer. Yeah. That certainly yeah. put things in perspective. But then something happened in the last two weeks that put all of that into perspective. Okay. I went to make myself a coffee. Oh, no. This was, oh, my goodness. This was like... Now, of course... For those of you who take things seriously, I am, of course, joking. Oh, yes, of course. I am certainly not comparing case no, birth stories. No, we Josh. And we Josh. Anyone who's wondering what the, the story is about our daughter Brownie's birth, I'll put the link to the episode of Radio Show in the show notes. You can go listen to that yeah. right now. And we do, Josh. To an extent, because I was pretty devastated when... Yeah, it is. Dan's very serious about coffee, right? You know, if you know anybody in your friends, family, whatever, who's like a serious... Coffee nerd. Yes, won't have any... Certain coffees will no. only have a particular coffee. Yes, yes. And it has to... You know, the crema has to be such a way. Yes, yes. And the beans have to be shiny. Yes, and yes. Lots of things. Foam in the milk yes, has yes. to be micro... Micro bubbles. Yes. Yes, yes. None this, of that. This is... 80s this cappuccino is rubbish. Yeah. Yes. So when I go to grind my beans... And I get a sound that sounds like a jackhammer on, yeah, on a motorway, yeah. digging up a motorway. You know that there's going to be a problem. And this is a new coffee machine. I've, okay, I've, bought it I me. bought down a new coffee machine at Christmas. Let me tell you, we watched, and stick with me on this, we watched a Hallmark film. Right. And that Hallmark film said that the best presence was oh. the things that you didn't realise that you needed until you got it. And then yeah. you realised you couldn't live without it. Something like that, yeah. It was along those lines. It, it, it was, was much the Vienna more... one, wasn't it? I don't was know it if Vienna it was. One? I don't think it was. I think it was... Look, this is no, terrible. I think it was the Vienna we, We're going down a, a... I have a feeling it's two turtle doves. I don't think it was. I think right. it was the Christmas... Was the, what was it called, Christmas in Vienna? Yeah, look, look. Either way, mm. they're both brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and we shall be watching them this Christmas. Mm. In fact, Kate will probably be watching them in September. Christmas just gone. That's the sort of approach mm. I took. And with coffee machines, I'd always take the approach that, well, look, I've got one, and it makes coffee, and it's fine, so what do I need a new one for? Mm. But I adopted this approach, and put it this way, K is here in my love, like and the coffee his, machine is just here. It's like his, his child. It is marvellous. Yeah. It is a marvellous construction. It's a great machine. Six yeah. months of coffee perfection. Yeah. Yes, you need a bit more skill, you and do. you need to put in a bit more effort, mm. but my goodness, it repays you in space. I get to smell it. You I do? can't drink coffee anymore, but I love it, and I get to smell it. So look, <laughs> go to Grind My Beans, Jackhammer Sound, look online, oh yeah, you're supposed to do this, and everything pops off, and it's just marvellous. Yeah. Do that. Crack. Yeah. And coffee machine broken. Grinder not working. It was not a good moment. Red lights flashing. Mm. So Kay gets home from a walk, mm -hmm. and I don't know how this happened, because you're, you, you like to look before you leap. Yeah. And you were like, come on, we can do this. Yeah. And we took the back off the machine. We did. With the help of a video. Yeah. We took the back off the machine, opened and the, it all and up. And the top bit. We yeah. opened it all up, basically. Yeah. And all, we saw all the wires. And yeah, yeah. it was terrifying. V vacuum cleaner. <laughs> yeah. Little brush. 
Yes. Brushing, vacuuming. But that, yes, but, I mean, we still don't know what it was. We so do know. There was, well... We there do was know. Something that looked like a stone, like a piece of gravel or something. As hard caught, as a stone. Caught in the metal bird the thing. Yeah. yeah, and we were like, what is that? It, honestly... Th- this thing, it looked like a piece of concrete. It and did it look like a piece such. of concrete. We were like, where, what? What? So, so it's come through in the bag. I've not spotted it when I've poured it into the yeah, bean hopper. Yeah, yeah. And down it's dropped, caught in the burrs, yeah. stopped the machine. So, but fixed. But we, we got it out. We, I, I got I a, know. what did we Amazing. do? To, I said, I need something to sort of lever it out, but yeah, yeah. not something that's sort of dangerous. So I think I got a um, chopstick. Yeah, something like that. And Leave just, it out. Yeah, just managed... There was a couple of sort of really whilst big sucking bits. sucking at the same time. Yes, whilst so having the hoover. into the machine. <laughs> it was quite the effort. But look, 10, 15 minutes. Teamwork. We did it. Made we did it. And we got work. out. We got out these bits of... And I said, what is it? And I smelt it. And I said, it smells like a coffee bean. But it looked like it was, a fossilised coffee bean. It did. It was like pale, yeah. beigey grey. Yeah. And it was rock solid. Yeah, yeah. Nuts. So it, it just... It looked like some weird coffee bean that had just gone wrong. But we fixed it. And yeah, now... we fixed it. I have developed an even stronger bond yes. to the coffee machine. He, he, she... When you go through experiences... It's even more special. When you go through experiences with things, it's a bit like me and Stuart the drone. Yeah. You know, when you go through experiences, it develops a bond. And now, you know, but I must admit, every time I use it, I put my hand on the top and my heart does flutter a touch. Right, so, the so far, though, the thing gods. is, though, we sort of know now, mm. you know, mm. and that's the thing. I think sometimes where you don't buy a great big plastic blob and you get something that has a bit more metal in it, which this does. It does. Sadly, not mm. enough metal. No. Because if it had a bit more metal, then I don't think we'd have had the problem in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, when something is a bit more quality mm. you can take it apart and actually mm. do something about it and Jeez. all was well you've never seen Dan so happy in yeah, your I know, life I know I've been appreciating my coffees all the I more I said right look just draw off an espresso and see what it's like so you did didn't you were like all is good now look if you thought that was a tale of uh, dramatic ups and downs such drama wait till you hear the stories that we have to share with you about certain garments which people have been knitting this time. Mm. Oh dear. Tales of woe, mm. but plans and joy abound. Discussions were had. It's going to be marvellous. Let's go for a walk to discuss it. Yes, yes. <laughs> the best way. The best way. It Some is. of the most successful business people yes. hold their, stu- their their team meetings walking. Yeah. Yes. And I think it is because you're moving forward. You think better when you're walking. You do, definitely. I don't know why, but I think it's a physiological thing Mm. without further ado Kate Jones what's on your needles (laughs) so what is on my needles well now this is nice little snort that's That's normally me isn't it yeah yeah it's quite funny so this is a sock project and it's a, a new design that will be coming out I'm not sure entirely because there's quite a big process involved with this one. I'll explain why. But um, definitely early August, possibly July. I'm just going to see how it goes. So a little while back, I I don't know why I had the thought, but I had the thought that I would like to design a pair of socks that's specifically for self-striping yarn. I don't know. I was trying to think why this came into my head. I think it's because I've got a little stash of self-striping yarn and I'm thinking, oh, it would be nice just to have a sort of go-to pattern for self-striping. So that made me sort of think about the whole business of self-striping yarn and what, what sort of stitch patterns work really well. And the thing that I wanted, and the thing really that you need with a self-striping yarn is movement within the pattern so the movement you know accentuates the striping basically so that made me think about what stitch patterns have movement in them and of course the classic stitch pattern that I think we all know and love is the feather and fan or old shale it's sometimes called now I have looked at that pattern before trying to incorporate it into socks and other things as well 
And the thing about it, generally speaking, is the stitch pattern is worked over quite a long repeat and it's usually an odd number of stitches, which is a tricky thing to incorporate into a sock without just doing a panel that runs down the front of the sock. And that's not what I wanted. I wanted something that went all the way around the sock, obviously then down the foot in a symmetrical way. So it sits symmetrical on the top of the foot. What I mean is that it's the same on one side as the other on the foot. And also that I could adapt for three sizes. So that was actually quite a task. I spent quite a long time looking at Feather and Fan and Old Shale and getting all of my stitch dictionaries out and looking at all kinds of things. And I just thought, you know, I, these stitch numbers, the stitch count, the pattern repeat numbers just weren't working. So I got some squared paper and I got a pencil and I started from scratch and I, I laid down a chart for 16 stitches, for 14 stitches and for 18 stitches because that's the repeat that I wanted it to fit into for each of the three sizes. And what by doing it that way, what it means is that you do get that symmetrical look on the top of your foot instead of it being different on one side to the other, you know what I mean. And I started from scratch and I just thought, okay, what are the mechanics of this stitch? What do I need to make the waving happen? And I thought about that and I thought, yeah, okay, I understand how that works. And then I just started to chart some things out and then I started to swatch. So this whole process went on for quite some time until I landed on something that I thought, oh my goodness, this works. And I adapted it for all three sizes. So each of the three sizes is slightly different but the overall look is, is the same. I did loads of swatching and then I cast on a pair of socks using the yarn, which I'll show you just as like a sort of sample practice. It wasn't the pair that I intended using for a pattern. So that worked out. So then I moved on to finding yarn and that whole process took a while. <laughs> then I got some yarn because in the, in the midst of all this, I came up with a name for it whilst watching Tom Brady. This is a real tale, isn't it? I mean, if you, <laughs> to track back the origins of a design, you're hearing it all now. So yeah, Tom Brady gave me the inspiration for the name of this design, and I thought that's just perfect. And I found a yarn that kind of tied in with the name, but I'm actually knitting three pairs of these because I found loads of yarns that I loved and I just wanted to start them all. So look, that's enough waffle. I'm going to show you this sock. I've got two socks completed in two different yarns and I've then got some others on the needles. So I'm going to show you the first sock and then tell you the name of it, what the name is going to be and where that inspiration came from. So here we go. So here is the first sock. Oh, isn't it lovely? So you see what I mean about the movement? We've got that movement that you get from feather and fan, but it's it's a non-traditional way, I would say, of doing feather and fan. Because, I, like I say, I've just designed this myself. So we've got this gorgeous self-striping yarn. This one is from Fab Funky Fibres, which is a UK dyer. And this colourway is called Big Top, meaning a circus big top, I presume. You know, it's very fun, bright, circusy colours, isn't it? And then at the cuffs, heels and toes is actually a Cascade Heritage because I wanted a candy floss colour because the name of these socks is going to be the Fairground Socks. When I say Fairground, what I mean is that old-fashioned traditional fairground with carousels and helter-skelters, none of your Blackpool Pe Pleasure Beach terrifying roller coaster situations. <laughs> that old-fashioned look. Do you know, if you've ever watched Downton Abbey, they go to a fair once, and it's that kind of a fair where you've got hook -a duck and coconut shy and the carousel, and you, you know what I'm saying. So it's that old-fashioned feel of a fairground. But Tom Brady sort of gave me the name because we were watching him on... What's that programme called? Uh, the Man in the Arena. The Man in the Arena. We were re-watching re that, and on one of them he just referenced that life was a real roller coaster. 
that's what put the thought into my head and led on to me calling these the fairground socks. So yeah, that's the first one, first sock finished. So you can see the pattern goes all the way around the leg and then it runs down the foot and it's, if you, I mean, if you were to look at these closely, you can see that it's the same on each side, which is just what I wanted. And it gives that beautiful movement in the sock. So that's the first one. And then the second one I've got to show you, this one, oh, look at that. Here are these, so it's all these purples and pinks. So this colorway from Freckled Whimsy is Queen of Hearts. My mini was a mini that came out of my stash. I think it might be a botanical yarn mini. Isn't this just gorgeous? You know, the stitch pattern, I, I when I was knitting it, I was like, this is truly the most addictive thing I've ever knitted, hence why I've got like, there's actually four pairs on my needles. And actually I've had these through an early test knit. Lovely Nicola agreed to test knit them for me in the early stages and she's completed a sock herself. So this sock that Nicola knitted, she used yarn from Mustache, Mustache yarn in the campfire colorway. And I think it just looks absolutely amazing. So thank you so much to Nicola for that early test knit. I just was so excited about this pattern and I showed it to her a couple of weeks ago and she's like, oh my goodness, you know, if you want anybody to test knit that, then I'm your woman. So she did. And you know, she knit that sock in like a day. <laughs> she was just so like into it. And she said the same thing as me, that the stitch pattern was really addictive. So thank you to Nicola for that beautiful sock. So yeah, back, this is the, back to the freckled whimsy. So yeah, it's this gorgeous, gorgeous self-striping. So I've got that one on the go. Now with these two, oh, don't they look lovely together? I've put in a heel flap and a turn. But what I've done is I've put in my square heel turn. If you see on this one. And what that does is it minimizes the disruption in the stripes because you don't have as many stitches to decrease on your gusset. So the, in my case, with both of these pairs, the only stripe it disrupted was this pink one here. And it's really not that bad. And then it seemed to be back to normal on the next stripe. So I think that's brilliant. But the other thing I've done with the pattern is I've also included my butterfly heel for those who don't want to put in a heel flap and gusset. So there's two heels. And this pair that I'm knitting is the one, the sample for the pair that's got the butterfly heel. So actually I could put this on a blocker. This is another freckled whimsy yarn and it's I Carried a Watermelon, a lovely Dirty Dancing reference. I'm just past the heel on this one. So I'll pop this on a blocker and show you. And this one is also fabulous. It's just, you know, the problem I had with this design was I just wanted to use all of the self-striping in the world and just cast them all on just to see what it looked like. And I've really had to rein myself in, otherwise I'll never get the pattern out, basically. So here we go. Here's that I carried watermelon with the butterfly heel. Oh, look, how fabulous is that? Isn't it wonderful with the green mini for the... Outside of the watermelon, yes, that'd be right, isn't it? And then all these pinks and reds and then two shades of green. Just gorgeous. I've done a slightly shorter version with this one just to see, you know, what it looked like slightly shorter. And that's my butterfly heel. So that's those are sort of all the pairs that are on the, the needles actively. But then I also have my original pair that I kind of swatched with, if you like. And these ones, you know, I might finish them at some point, I might not. But they were really just there as a practice. This is a yarn that I'd had in my stash, stash actually for quite some time and it's Nicole C. Mendes, who does gorgeous yarn. And the colourway was Carpe Diem. It was a Harry Potter reference from a club and it was like a mystery club. And I'll be honest, I didn't understand that reference related to Harry Potter when I got it. And I googled it and I think it's something to do with fan fiction, Harry Potter fan fiction. But it's a lovely yarn. So this was the Carpe Diem. And I am past the heel on this, you can see, but it's still on the needle, so that's why I'll hold it that way. 
But look how beautiful that is. And I just used some of my own hand dyed for the cuff heels and toes on these. But sort of coordinated. But how beautiful. So that's all. <laughs> that's all of my fairground socks. So you can see how this has completely taken over my knitting life. To the point of sourcing some fabric to make a bag. <laughs> which I did. This fabric is beautiful. It's from Sophie Allport in the UK. Look at the fabric that I found. It's got that sort of traditional fairground look for me. So I made a bag, a fairground bag, to hold my socks. So that has been how sort of intensely addicted to this pattern I've been. And I'm just loving all the self-striping. The freckled whimsy is gorgeous. Gosh, and Carrie did a, an update recently as well, and I was like, no, 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 don't buy, <laughs> don't buy any more. What Carrie did actually is, because I told her I was designing something for self-striping, she hasn't seen this yet, so if, she's, if you're watching Carrie, this will be the first time she's seen it. But she very kindly offered, because later in the year, in September, we're going to be running a self-striping knit-along for everyone. It won't be a patron-only event, it's an everyone event. And Carrie very kindly offered to donate two skeins to that. So that's fantastic and just so kind of her. Well, that's prizes. Prizes. Right. But that was just so lovely of her. So, yeah, I've been completely, completely obsessed by this and I'm working my way through the pattern. And like I said, as soon as I'm at that stage where I can get it properly into testing, fully into testing, then I'll, we'll, we'll work our way through that. And I'll just keep you posted as to when the pattern will be out. Um, so I hope you like it. And I hope you want to pull out all of your self-striping stash and knit up some fairground socks because that's clearly <laughs> what I've been doing with my time of late. Dan Jones, what's on your needles? Yeah, I decided that the time had come. I've, I've got good enough now. I'm so accomplished as a knitter that I should tackle a Stephen West pattern. <laughs> <laughs> I jest. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you, no, you, you don't, Jess. I am knitting you a, are Stephen knitting West a Stephen West pattern, but not anything. Basically, many years ago, I tried to knit a Stephen West pattern and failed. And it was a simple hat. Yeah. And I know why I failed. And I'm just deciding what the right way to avoid failure this time is. Right. But last time I failed because I will have got... It's a two-round repeat... And I definitely have got confused about which rounds I'm on. Really? Not now, then. Ah, oh, right, OK. And that's why when I finish knitting this particular hat, it's the wind sheaf. Yep. And when I finished knitting it, it was like totally off. It has like a twist on it. Yeah, there's it's like, like a, a twisted a, a rib. A twisted that, rib that moves, isn't it? Yeah, the, there's, a, there's a panel of, of rib that runs right the way up the hat, that, that turns around the hat. Yeah. And I clearly got confused about the rows that I was on, which led to me doing either knit two togethers. Well, basically what would have happened is I will have done knit two togethers when I shouldn't have been, and I also probably have made stitches when I shouldn't have. I don't recall, though, when I knitted the hat, ending up with too many stitches at any point which you would do if you are making stuff or too few so mm. but there i do have a or i did have a tendency to fudge it when Kay wasn't looking <laughs> so there is a chance that i did have that and i've just simply forgotten but look now look why am i knitting a hat well i'll tell you because I want to knit a propagansy, and to knit a propagansy, I'm going to have to do that on long DPNs. Mm. And they'll be slightly, well, they'll be thicker than the ones that I'm used to knitting socks with, because they're like, what size do I knit socks on? Two and a half? Two and a half mil, but I think they are. Quite they're not two small. and a half. I think they're not they're, two and a half. They might be 2.75 or three. I think on, in that book, it, it's three or 3.25. Right, okay. So it's a little bit thicker. It's a thicker. tight gauge unit, Gamsey's two, isn't yes. it? Yes. Absolutely. And that's good because, you know, historically that's been my sort of natural mm, place. That is true. And so I'm thinking, okay, so I need to knit. It's a thicker yarn I'd be using with a Gansey. 
I wouldn't be using fingering weight. I would be using Aaron weight. DK, I DK think. DK weight. I think it's DK. And so I'm thinking, right, okay, I need to get used to knitting with thicker needles and thicker yarn using DPNs. Because my DPN experience, because when I was knitting hats, it's a few years ago now, I was doing it on circulars. Mm. Is that right? Short circular. Short circulars. Yeah, yeah. Short circs. Oh. <laughs> I'm never ever going to talk like that. That's just wrong. So I was knitting on short circulars. Uh, do you know what? That's right up there with, in this country, I don't know why this winds me up, but if people go to the White Swan for lunch, they call it the mucky duck. It makes me want to rip my ears off and flush them down the loo. Why do they do that? I don't know. I I've can't never heard that in my it. life. Oh, Where do you hear that? Everywhere. I've heard people call pubs the mucky duck, but I thought they were called that. No. They're called the white swan. They are. But a white swan is not a mucky duck, it's a white it, it swan. It is the exact opposite. Yeah. Hence the reason it why they call it. It would be a very clean duck, wouldn't it, if it was white? Oh, it's so cool. Oh, go down the mucky duck. Oh, the, that's so cool. I don't get it either. In fact, I don't get it to the point of it makes me w want to jump out a window. <laughs> It's a bit like people who, when they talk about musicals, they they like shorten it. Oh, yeah. JC Superstar. Yeah, we don't do this in or, this house. Or, uh, have you seen Les Mis? Yeah, we don't like, we don't. Saigon know. is amazing. Yeah. It's seven, older... Oh, Seven Brides. Uh, we yeah. don't mind Seven Brides so much. No, although... But, yeah, still, in, uh, we do like the full title, but yes. JC Superstar, for me, is like the... No, 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 don't. It's just wrong. Just don't. But look, so my plan is this. Thicker DPNs, thicker yarn, sort out my technique, because I do recall trying to knit them on DPNs before, and I do recall, Hats. yes, mm. and I do recall having the ladder issue, mm. which is funny, because that ladder issue still exists. Yes. But look, this hat... It's making me twitchy. Yeah, I mean, my... What I've learned, I... Like on socks, you will have seen recently, I remember saying recently, oh, there's a ladder on that. And mm. I made adjustments. A mitten. A mitten, a mitten. Yeah, that was yeah. it. Yeah. Ladder on the mitten, made adjustments, fixed it. Mm. Boom. Mm. But for some reason, going up in thickness, going up in thickness, mm. it changes the ball game a bit. And so my theory is I'm going to knit through this and I'm going to smooth you, off yeah, the rough edges. Yeah, you're using it as a learning process. I am indeed. You? And I am learning. And the beauty of this is I'm knitting this for my mum. Yeah. Because my mum... I mean, unfortunately, the conversation didn't go as well as I thought because I said, oh, mum, you know that hat that you've gone on about so many times that you really love that you wanted me to knit another one? Oh, I'm, I'm going to do it for you. She went, oh, oh, do you mean the blue tit yarn one? <laughs> went no no Kay knitted you that one <laughs> I knitted her a hat years ago with the West Yorkshire spinners she lost that blue tit she lost it and then found it in a pocket of a coat I yeah think. she lost it for months yeah yeah she did she, she thought she'd lost it on a walk yes and then she found it yes. in, in a coat pocket. Yes. Yeah. That's genius. No, no, so I had to say, no, Mum, no, no. It's Not the, that one. It's, it's the other hat. She went, oh, OK. She does have a few no. hats that we've she made her, though, over the years. She was totally cool. She's really looking forward to it. Actually. She's really looking forward. And look, look, I mean, look, that's progress, baby. It's pretty. He's flying. Now, I'm using Serdar Jewel Spun Aaron. And the reason why Kay bought this for me was I really quite fancy. Before, when I was knitting lots of hats... I was using hand spun and Kay found this because it has a hand spun vibe. Yeah, it does. And it does. It does. There's barber polling, which I really like. And yeah. So, so yeah, it's Serdar uh, Jewel Spun. It's perfectly pleasant to work with and, and it's, you know, knitting up, I mean, it's knitting up very nice. Very nice. W were it not for the ladders, yeah. you know, it would be absolutely perfect. The shade is glacier. But we'll totally get there. But yeah, I need to work out what the right approach is for making sure I don't forget where I'm at. Ah, oh, right, okay. Well, the start of your round could do with being in the middle of a needle and then you could put a stitch mark on. No, I always know when I'm at the start of the round. Oh. The issue is knowing what round I'm on. Well, just use a clicker. Round one or round two. Is that okay? Well, of course it's okay. I didn't know if I was being totally inept. Having to well, use a clicker no. for a two-round repeat. Well, no. 
I would say no. You're not being inept. You, you're doing what is necessary for Good. you to achieve success. Good. In that so, case, you know, I shall not feel inept, and I shall go ahead and use it. Yeah, and it's 100 percent acrylic. This yarn. You it's know. not premium acrylic. No, well, it's just acrylic, it says. Sadly, no. I can't stretch to premium acrylic. No premium in there, but no. it's really lovely. The ball's ginormous. It's 200 grams. So you can easily get two hats out of this, I'm sure. And obviously, it's gorgeously soft because it's acrylic and perfect for gift knitting, isn't it? You know? Knit a hat, you well, can go in the washer. Thank you so much. What else is on your needles. So, the next thing I've got to show you is my reading shawl. Now, I've done loads on this since I last showed you, and it's getting really big. It may be that after I've worked my way through this one, I'm gonna go back and knit another one and make some changes because, well, I'll explain to you what, uh, why and I'm just going to see what happens I'm carrying on knitting and I'm going to see what happens so if you remember from last time this is a project that came about because my back gets cold when I'm sat on the floor reading I thought what I need to resolve this is a, a shawl a reading shawl so I've started one and I'm a good way through now and I'm using a set of advent minis from pixie yarns which I got last advent season and what I'm doing is I'm striping the minis but I'm holding the minis double so each section is two minis held together and then for the stripes I'm also holding two of my own hand dyed yarns together and I wanted it to be enormous and it's going to be enormous I'm just on a neutral stripe at the moment this is really hard to, to hold up because it is getting so big but here we go this is sort of half of it. I'll try and stretch it out. So this is where I'm up to. The last time I showed you, I was just at the start of that gold stripe. So I've worked through the gold, through this sort of olivey, paley, limey, greeny, through this lovely, gorgeous, jewel-toned green. And I'm now back to working one of the neutral stripes. And it's really big and I've, I'm, I've done one, two, three, four, five, six colours. I'm just about to start my seventh coloured stripe and there's 12 altogether because there's obviously 24 minis in an advent calendar and I'm doubling them so that gives me 12 sections and then obviously 12 sections of the neutral colour, so I'm alternating. But my, I suppose my biggest concern at the moment is that obviously as I'm working down, my rows are getting longer, so I'm getting fewer garter ridges out of my minis, which in itself is not a problem. That's obviously gonna happen because it's a triangle shawl, you're increasing, that's going to happen. My bother at the minute, you know, this was the sixth stripe and you can see it's not very wide. So as I keep moving down, you know, I'm thinking how wide is that stripe going to be when I get to the 12th section? But one thing I'm doing to alleviate that is the width of my, uh, my contrast stripes are getting narrower. So they started off being five ridges, then now four ridges. And then after this one, it'll go down to three, then two. So that's obviously going to alleviate it. But in hindsight, I think what I should have done is done a narrower contrast stripe. So ultimately, what I might do is I'm just going to see what happens with this. I'm just going to carry on knitting it and I'm just seeing what happens. But if when I get to the end of it, I think, do you know what? I need to adjust that. Then I do have another advent set from sherry iris that i got i don't think it was it i don't know if it was this year just gone or the one before i can't actually remember my memory is terrible but in any case i've been saving it for something special so I, I know that i can use that to make another and with that because all the the colors are sort of very gentle and paley sort of pastely sort of colors i would have a darker contrast instead of with this one is pale so plans are there to adjust this if i need to but certainly you know it's fabulous and i'm still absolutely loving it 
and you can do, see I'm working through these stripes in a sort of rainbowish order. I've gone through the greens and my next two I'm moving into blue. Yeah, red, orange, yellow, green, blue. Yes, and then it will be indigo because I do have two blues which are really dark that I can use for indigo and then we go into the violets and purples and there's quite a few of those. But these are the two that I'm going to be working next which are lovely. And I had, I had an issue, right? And Sophie at Pixie Yarns was fabulous. Uh, one of the minis, so when I got this advent set, I started knitting something else with it and changed my mind. So I ripped it out, but clearly didn't rip all of it out. And I can't find the actual project I started with it. So basically I had one mini missing out of the advent set. Per I actually purchased a set of minis from Sophie thinking that it would solve the issue but the, the colours weren't quite right so anyway long story short Sophie actually had one of the minis because I told her which one it was I could tell her she actually had a prototype mini in her studio from the advent calendar and she sent it to me is that not amazing and it's this one actually which is beautiful so she sent me her prototype mini so that I can have the complete set again because I was so silly and used it so how amazing is that? And thank you, Sophie, for doing that. It's just fantastic. So yes, I'm moving into the blues next and we'll just see how this goes. Um, like I say, I'm absolutely loving it and I am trying to get through this as quick as I can purely because I want it. <laughs> I want the shawl. Um, and if that, that's a good enough reason, isn't it? But it is big now. This is upside down, but you can. it helps you see the colours. Isn't it lovely? Oh, it's so nice. So again, I'll keep you posted on this and I may well show it you again next time because I really, really just want to knit it. So what else have you got to show us? Uh, it's, look. Uh, uh, oh, well. Oh, well. Look, I never was in love with this project. So this is the stacker, is yes, it? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's the stacker. And uh, you, you may recall from the many times that I've shown it, that I've never really been into this too much. And there's lots of different reasons. I would say first and foremost is, after knitting lots of patterns by the same designer, because it's the same designer who designed the anniversary and the Radari and all those great jumpers that I've knitted, that are brilliant, they're brilliant. But this one isn't, because it, it is different because there's flat sections. You start off in the round and then you go flat and then up you go. But it, it, we just couldn't work it out. So Kay wrote it out for me. You know, Kay looked mm. at it and, and to be fair, there were elements of us not fully getting what he was saying but understanding where we needed to get to. So going, right, okay, we yeah. do this, this and this and this will make it happen. So it was yeah. our knowledge or Kay's knowledge of garment knitting and what needed to be done that enabled us to get to the point that we got to. So anyway, got through, separated off. I was perfectly cool with the flat knitting, actually, yeah, which so was this, great. From here, is knit flat? Because you obviously have to do decreases for the V and for the arms. So I was perfectly cool with knitting flat, and I, I enjoyed it, actually. You know, So that was good. That's a positive, and it's nice to pull a positive from this. But then... Knit all the way up to the top, which was fine, and then did the other side, which was fine, and then came to three needle bind off, and I was just an idiot. I three needle bound off. I, I did the back to the back. Yeah, it looked like a halter neck. Like that. Maybe you should have worn it as that. I should have worn it as a halter neck, shouldn't I? Yeah. And so, so I was like, right, okay, I'm learning how to knit flat, and I've made a mistake, so I need to fix the mistake because. I'm learning how to knit flat and I need to fix it, otherwise I'm never going to learn. And so I was thinking, right, okay, I need a good chunk of time that I can really invest in that to do it right. So put the project away, hibernated it for a bit, waiting for the time to sort of appear. The time did appear, but then that then set off a conversation between Kay and I and it just sort of, we just sort of came to the conclusion that I don't really think... I've developed good skills, I think, in knitting yoked bottom-up mm. jumpers. I want to knit one for Kay. 
Mm. Because the solia didn't work because the sleeves were too long because I wasn't experienced enough. The clear quat wasn't right because we knitted the wrong size. Mm. It's too big. Mm. And that's because I hadn't got the experience with sizing. Subsequently knitted a few for myself, nailed the technique. I want to make one for Kay. Mm. Kay, though, doesn't like this yarn. So... Another project I've got on the go, which I'll show you next time, which is the Aaron Harper Gansey with the Jameson Smith Thicker Weight Yarn. And I feel really confident that by knitting through that project, I'm already learning loads. I'm even making notes, you know, and I know what I'm... I, I understand it, and I find it cool to understand what I'm doing so that I know, right, OK, I'm pretty sure that when I finish knitting this and I've seen the size it comes out, I'll be able to knit K, one of the jumpers that I love... One of the yoke jumpers in lovely colours that will really suit her in the Jameson and Smith, which we really like the feel of, yeah. job done. Yeah. So then we come back to this, this let lopey thing, which, Kay, I mean, dear, I even call it this let lopey thing. <laughs> Kay doesn't like how the yarn feels anyway, but well, she chose this project because she was like, oh, you know, this I is going to be fine. Yes, so it's going to be fine. fine. Look, it fits and it fits right. I've tried it on. It fits so that's well. all really good. You know, it's ready to go on the the, yeah. the finishing off. Well, but what we haven't got is it isn't. It isn't. It isn't. Well, it's where it should be in relation to the pattern prior to the next stage of the finishing off. So the right thing to do is because I'm just not enjoying knitting this right now. I would happily not finish it, but then when she put it on, it's like, well, this is crazy. It's crazy. Oh, because we, yeah. Because it looks really good and, and I'm sure that it's something that she'll wear and it's something that will last for a long time. So the right decision is to put this away and to come back to it yeah. when there's a bit of love reappearing. Yeah, I, I was all ready to pick up around here, you know, for Dan then to knit the collar band, whatever it's called, you know, the rib. But the instructions are, you know, the, the, these pattern instructions, we've, we've said this before, so we won't harp on about it, but they're, they're not good. They're really vague. They're very brief and difficult to understand and means you've got a lot of work to do. So, for example, it just tells you how many stitches to pick up the, the whole way round here. And it just says to pick them up evenly. Now, in my mind, that sh the pattern should say you need to pick up X number across the back and then X number down here and up here. It doesn't say that. So what it would mean for me is, is working out how many to pick up across the back and then I need to then divide the remaining by two. You have to make sure that a knit stitch lands right in the V. So there's a lot involved in just, you know, picking up the stitches and... And this isn't Kay's project. No. This is my project. And wh where we want to be is, and where I want to be is, I want to be knitting through and finishing it off and giving it to her and saying, there you go. Yeah. Not like saying, oh, I need help with this or I'm not really sure about that. No. So it's just being hibernated. Yeah, yeah. We will come back to it when we we've got a bit more time. We will come back to it. We'd, we'd, we've and just not got off. the space in the minute, at the minute to, to sort of devote to picking up all of that and then picking up these sleeves as well and doing all of that. It's quite time consuming. And picking up stitches around sleeve things and necks i've done before i've made dan tank tops and it's not a problem it's not a problem if you get good instructions having to work all those numbers out yourself is really time consuming to do it properly and like i said we've just not got the space to do it so we will get back to it i i will i absolutely yeah. will so it, it's gone goodbye and i'm going For to be now. focusing yeah and i'm going to be focusing on the aaron harper Kenzie, on the roosty tank top but then also with getting a full size sleeved jameson and smith yes. yoke, yes. like the ones that i love 4k I would love in the that. perfect colors i want it pink that will fit because i know how to size it right yeah. I, that's where i want to be at i don't want to be messing around with this and with regards to my learning and progressing, I want to focus on on the Gansey stuff. Yeah, I mean, you, the thing is, you know, you don't have to know everything about everything, do you? You know, I if, don't if want to seem. If there's a no, you you don't want to. You're not interested in seeming, and I know a lot of you out there will be like, no, nope, I'm not interested in seeming either. You know, I want to knit what gives me pleasure and what I enjoy, and you know, I, I think it's a great thing that you've identified that that. Is well, the I direction you want to take. Because previously it's like, oh, you know, I should learn these things. I need to learn for myself. And yes, 
you should learn if you want to learn how to do that thing. If you're not interested, you know, you wouldn't go and do a degree in history if you didn't like history, would you? So it's the same kind of thing. So I think it's a good thing that you've identified that. I don't see the point in learning how to knit a seamed garment when I can knit a perfectly sized, gorgeous looking. Yeah, and you enjoy doing it in the round you, garment. And I said to you, you would you would loathe seaming a garment. So I'm going to invest my time, my learning time in 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 the Gansey stuff yeah. and in in getting this, you know, Jameson Smith. Because that's lovely, Kate. lovely yarn. Perfect. Mm, mm. What's the last thing you're showing us? So the last thing I've got to show you is. A My Favourite Blanket, but it's not the My Favourite Blanket you've seen before. It's the first My Favourite Blanket that I cast on that I've been working through alongside filming and knitting the second one, which you've all seen. So this one, I'm going to pull it out of the bag because it's a little bit mahoosive. So this is my first one, and I'm to the point now with this one, I've worked through to the end of section eight. And that basically is all of the fancy business. So section eight takes me up to the point where I'm now about to start just decreasing for the other end. So I'm at a really good stage where I can show you. And I, yeah, I promised to show this a couple of episodes ago and well, I didn't. So <laughs> here it is now. So here is my first, my favorite blanket. So for this one, I've used mainly just like leftover skeins that are in my stash so it's a stash buster the more recent colors you probably see some colors in there that you do recognize that are ones that i've dyed up because i had the yarn you know i'd done a test run of a dye a particular dye color and i thought well i've got that yarn i'm going to use it to knit into this one so there will be some yarns in there that you probably recognize but there's also some in there that you won't because the vast majority are just from my stash and i literally when i was knitting this i wasn't particularly thinking about the color progression or anything like that it was purely just to test the pattern so i just went to my stash and grabbed two yarns and then went and grabbed another two yarns but I think it looks brilliant you know it's a very scrappy stash buster version so I think it's nice just to see it in a different way you know not that kind of deliberate planned colour and yeah I'm about now about now I'm <laughs> I'm now ready to start the decrease sections which obviously we haven't got to yet in the show but I am a little bit ahead and I need to be a little bit ahead just to check everything, you know, all the numbers and that everything works. But I just thought it would be fun to show you because now I'm at this stage where I've completed that centre section and ready to start with the decreases. And I just love it. So I mean, you can see this is, this is the length that we've added in the fancy business section. So it is quite a good amount. So it's definitely a rectangular blanket rather than square. And it just look. I think it just looks lovely. I love this pink section here. This blue one here has got some of uh, fairy garden in that I've dyed. I couldn't tell you for the life of me what that first section is, you know, because it is just randomness from my stash. But I think it just looks lovely. So yeah, there we go. That's my other my favourite blanket that I'm working on, in tandem, if you like, with the one that you've been seeing all through. The series. And there's been lots of people asking to see that, hasn't yeah, there? Yeah, so, there's been loads of people asking yes. to see it, so it's in all of its gorgeous gloriness. That's an awful lot of blanket knitting. It is an awful lot of blanket knitting. Yeah, it was, that, a, it was a difficult one at the start of the year because we wanted to do a special series. Kay was very keen yeah. to do the special series around the blanket, but she also knew that it was going to be a huge commitment. Yes. Because of the amount of knitting. And we're, we're so glad that, that you know... We've done it, but equally, I think you're quite looking forward to having it finished. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think the problem is when you've got a creative mind, you know, and I love designing things, and you can see with those socks and, you know, the reading shawl 
you know I've designed myself I really love designing things and I want to get on and knit them but then I've got something else you know like this blanket that I designed before and I'm equally as excited about it but I'm only one person and so I'm like oh gosh I've got to split my time between each of these as well as obviously doing everything else that we do here and this is Um, what led us as well to for, for for me to do s- some more smaller projects because I've been doing like bigger projects yeah. that that you know d- take a little bit longer to to knit. Actually, if I do a few smaller projects, it can work for me because I can like hone in on areas of technique that I need to improve upon. But also as well with regards to freeing up Kay's time mm. so that she's not always worried about finishing projects to show here on the show. I can be showing a few more finished projects. And actually, I'm quite enthused by that, you know, because it's like a change in the yeah. vibe that we've had since we started. Because, you know, I was always like the straggler that was being dragged along. Whereas now, actually, I've realised... You know, I've done that in just a few days mm. and I think I could probably finish that in a couple of weeks. With, oh, easily, with, I think, easily. And that would never have been the case before. That would always have taken yeah, I mean, way longer than that. The things you were knitting, generally, you took a long yeah. time to finish. Yeah, and I'm referring to when I was knitting hats yeah. and I was knitting socks. Whenever I've knitted anything, it's always taken a while. Yeah. And that's because when I was doing hats, I wasn't as good. Subsequently, in the following years, I focused in on yeah. garments and got good at that. For those of you who, you know... I couldn't recommend to you more about expanding your engine size, going after big projects, because then when you come back to the smaller ones, it's like, whoa, hold on a minute. Yeah, That's definitely. Like... I think it's great to have some smaller projects on the go as well as as well as big ones, because anybody can get a bit kind of weary, can't you? And your perspective finishing, as well. Finishing things gives, gives you a boost. Your perception is your reality, and if all you're used to is knitting hats, a hat can feel like a slog. I guess. You knit one... Mm. Oh, I, it depends on the hat as well, you know. Absolutely. But it, it, it honestly, it is an absolute fact. You know, your perception of your life is your mm-hmm. reality. So if all you have experience of is knitting small things, if you then go knit something big, it might be a slog the first time you do it, but mm-hmm. it will just change everything else that you do. Mm-hmm. It'll make everything mm-hmm. else come off the needles fast. Look, that's enough of that because yes. it's time for us to get wet. It's also time for me to unveil my summer outfit. Oh, Prepare yourselves. Very handsome. <laughs> that sounds like I was setting myself up for you to say very handsome. It wasn't well, at all. No, I was going to make told, a joke about I told you that yesterday. Shorts. So. Oh, I'm getting embarrassed now. So without further ado, we shall say <laughs> it's time for the, the next episode of The Rise and Fall of the Monasteries and our wonderful visit to Finkel Priory. years ago, a way of life arrived in Europe that shaped the development of the world we live in today. Healthcare and education are just two of the many innovations pioneered by the men and women of the monasteries. From the height of their powers at the time of the Normans to their total destruction at the hands of a tyrant king and a cruel emperor. This is one of the most epic stories the world has got to tell and whilst their way of life may have virtually disappeared, Everywhere you look across Europe, you'll find ruined monasteries, echoes of their fascinating existence. And in this series, I'm gonna take you to some of my absolute favorites. This is gonna be quite an adventure. Welcome to the rise and fall of the monasteries.
Welcome back everyone to the rise and fall of the monasteries. You join me in Cock and Wood, en route to the banks of the River Weir. And this is a part of the world that I used to know really well. As you'll recall from episode one of this series, I grew up a chorister at York Minster and every year York Minster used to have a three choirs festival. So the choirs of York, Ripon and Durham would travel to each other's cathedrals once a year to perform together as one massed choir. And we're actually on the outskirts of the ancient city of Durham. And I remember going past here with my friends on the coach on the way to Durham Cathedral. We've traveled 50 miles from Jervau Abbey and the Yorkshire Dales. And for the one and only time this series, we're in Weirdale. To the north lies the village of Horton Le Spring, and to the south lies the ancient city of Durham, resting place of St Cuthbert, and once home to the impressively titled Prince Bishops. There were actually prince bishops all over Europe, and it might seem a little bit odd to us today, a religious man holding a title which effectively saw him as a autonomous ruler who could raise armies and also set taxes. But in the Middle Ages, religious men with power, it had become the norm, and this was all because of the Crusades, which we spoke about in episode three of this series. As the Crusades raged, there was a number of religious monastic fighting warriors and so a man filling that role in the north of England it was perfectly acceptable but what made this county need a prince bishop why was it that prince bishops were installed here but nowhere else in England why well, it's all because of the proximity to Scotland That was at least the theory, but successive Scottish armies came absolutely pillaging through this valley and this part of the world right the way through history. This county became a buffer zone between Scotland and England, and it was designed specifically to soak up attacks. But we're not here to talk about pillaging Scottish armies or in fact Prince Bishops. We're here to visit what I think is one of the most unique religious sites in all of the north of England. Neil, do you recall on our last visit, we met St Benedict, who wrote the famous rule of St Benedict. And every abbey that we visited so far this series has based its life around the rule of St Benedict, from the Cistercians to the Saviniacs. But Benedict himself actually formed his own monastic order called the Benedictines. And it was the Benedictines themselves who arrived here in the 13th century to construct the priory that we're gonna to visit today. But what was going on in the wider world in the 13th century? Let's find out. As the 13th century began in the East, one of the greatest rulers the world has ever seen was just appearing. In 1206 AD, Temujin of the Mongols was given the title Genghis Khan, which means universal leader.
For the next 22 years, he will lead the United Mongol tribes as they conquer the largest continuous land empire in history. The Mongolian Empire will rule 25% of the world for the next 150 years. Along the way, they will develop the world's first international postal system, known today by historians as the Yam. As Genghis Khan was rising to power in the east, back in England, a new king was being crowned. His name was John, and his reign would be far from successful. Following the death of his brother, the famous King Richard the Lionheart, John had huge shoes to fill at home and abroad. Not only was John now King of England, but he was also Duke of Normandy in France, a title which he had inherited from his great-great-grandfather, William the Conqueror. Within three years of being crowned, he'd lost Normandy to the King of France. This led John to abandon his French roots and become the first King of England to speak English since 1066 AD. The seed had been planted for the acceptance of English as the national language. John's calamitous rule culminated in the signing of a document which many believe was the foundation stone for Western democracy. It was called Magna Carta, and it stated, in essence, that everyone was answerable to the law, including the king. King John really was quite the man, wasn't he? And you may recognize him too from the original stories of Robin Hood. He was the ultimate and the usual main villain. And how he's portrayed in those stories is historically correct because he did indeed scheme to overthrow King Richard the Lionheart. He's sort of sad if you think about it that he did then inherit the throne, but actually everything turned out all right in the end because Magna Carta really does lie at the heart of our society and many Western societies across the world to this day. But we're here to learn about Finkel Priory. And I'm conscious that many of you might not even know what a priory is. This is Mount Grace Priory in the North York Moors National Park. We'll be visiting here later in the series. It's called a priory because it's smaller in size than a monastery and it's ruled over by a prior, hence the name priory. So why is an abbey called an abbey? Well, it's because it's bigger than a priory and so is ruled over by an abbot or an abbess, hence the name abbey. And all these buildings are monasteries, a word which itself is derived from the Latin word monasterium, which means an area used by a monk. It's surprisingly simple when you know how, isn't it? Like most things, I suppose. But look, it's time that I picked up the story of Finkel Priory, because this collection of monastic buildings is unlike any that we've visited so far this series. Because whilst they were constructed in 1230 AD, their life had actually become the very first Finkel Priory buildings have been constructed about a hundred years before that. At this point in Godric's life, he was just approaching his 40s and he decided that he wanted to live out what was left of his life as a hermit. But what exactly was a hermit? Well, the, the, the way of life, the hermit way of life had been developed by a man called Paul. He's often known as Paul the Hermit. And in the third century, just as Christianity was really sort of taking off, he moved out into the deserts of Egypt to live a life of seclusion and of prayer. And he became known in Latin as Eremita, and Eremita means of the desert. 
Now, as Christianity spread across Europe, this way of life became popular, and anyone who was living a secluded life of prayer was considered Eremita. An Eremita becomes hermit in, well, modern and old English. It was about this time that the history books of the day called Godric a pirate. Now, it's thought that the word pirate at the time doesn't have the same connotations that it does today because modern piracy didn't really come into existence until 1650. But it's still a pretty epic title for your job description, isn't it? Pirate. It's thought that the word pirate just meant merchant seaman. In his travels, on the sea, Godric came across Holy Island and he learnt of St Cuthbert. And he clearly was a great inspiration to him because he set out to try and find as much information as he could about Christianity. I think it's absolutely fascinating that Godric chose this moment to make a, a huge change in his life, right about the time that he turned 40. It makes you think, doesn't it, of how many people today, potentially then through history, have done, some, have done similar things round right about the age of 40, to leave his gallivanting ways behind him and to settle down as a hermit somewhere around here. And, he was definitely following in the footsteps of his idol, St Cuthbert, because I just can't imagine that it's a coincidence that he chose not... We can't be more than two miles from Durham Cathedral, which is where St Cuthbert is buried. Now, when I say forever home, you have to remember that that is not the 21st century type of forever home. This is quite literally the medieval version of a forever home. And when Godric moved in here, he was in his sort of mid 40s. And you have to remember that in medieval times, the average age, I mean, really, you were pushing it if you got to 30. So he must have thought when he arrived here, whatever happens next is fine. I've had a great life and I shall live out whatever years that remain in this lovely, tranquil spot. So where did he choose? Which spot did he select for his forever home? Let's go find out. Welcome everyone to the cloister at Finkel Priory. Now, the first thing you're gonna notice about this place 
is there's quite a lot to see. And the reason for that primarily is because of its position in that buffer zone in between Scotland and England. It was simply too dangerous to come and take too much of this away once the priories and the monasteries had all been closed down. Now, what that means is we're left with an absolute treasure. And what's so perfect about this place is it gives us a much better opportunity to see exactly what a medieval monastery would have looked like. With regret, much of what we see here was built after Godric's death, and we'll actually come on to the story of this later on in the episode. When Godric arrived in 1118 AD, there was just a flat piece of land on a curve in the river, perfect for him to build his very first, very simple hut. Over time though, he also built a chapel and a church, of which now has actually been incorporated into the Benedictine Priory that stands on this site. Godric was constructing these very first buildings of Finkel Priory on his own. And th the really amazing thing is, he still opted to live in his simple hut that was 1.6 kilometers downstream. It wasn't until 1150, when he was 85 years old, that he was finally persuaded to come and live here. But I don't know about you, I'm about the age that Godric was then, and I don't like change either, so I don't blame him for sticking to what he knew. But finally, in 1150 AD, he moved upstream to here. By this point in his life, Godric had become quite famous. And if you think about it, it's not surprising at all, is it? The seafaring pirate who'd come to live a life of secluded prayer by the river in the north of England. But given it was secluded, Godric was always very happy to receive visitors. All Red of Revo regularly visited here. And even the Pope himself wrote to Godric on many an occasion to seek his sage advice. But at 85 years old, Godric needed some help. Clearly though, he did not accept this willingly. I mean, a man who'd lived till 85 in a hut downstream of here that regularly flooded, instead of coming to a much drier stone-built place, clearly was happy with his lot. Funnily enough though, at this point in his life, Godric agreed to move into one of the buildings behind me here. And he was also joined by two monks, two Benedictine monks called Reginald and Henry. They actually moved from the Benedictine monastery that's now Durham Cathedral. And they came here to help and support him in what they thought would be the final years of his life. Now, once Godric had settled in, and Henry and Reginald were ready to accept visitors, Olred came to visit. And it was at this point that Olred decided to persuade Reginald to write Godric's life story. And thankfully he did. He wrote a very detailed life story. And it's thanks to him that we know any of this story today. So as we explore these first original buildings of Finkel Priory, shall we see if we can find out what Godric looked like at this point in his life. He was vigorous and strenuous in mind, whole of limb and strong in body. He was of middle stature, broad-shouldered and deep-chested, with a long face, grey eyes most clear and piercing, bushy brows, a broad forehead and a pointed chin. His beard was thick and longer than the ordinary, his mouth well shaped, in youth his hair had been black, in age as white as snow. His legs were somewhat slender, his knees hardened from frequent kneeling, his whole skin rough beyond the ordinary, until all this roughness was softened by old age. What 
I think he's just wonderful about that is in this series so far, we've not known a, a clue about what any of the characters that we've discovered look like. And thanks to Reginald, what an absolutely perfect description. Godric sounds like a man whose life of adventure was written all over his face. And whilst this was a hermitage, which just means the home of a hermit, he was a family man too, because he moved his mum and his brother and his sister just a stone's throw away from here. So when Godric moved in here, what buildings were there for him and Reginald and Henry to live in? Well, there was three huts to keep their tools for all the work that they needed to do on their land, which they farmed to provide themselves with food. They also had fish from the river too. There was a simple house and kitchen, which we've just left behind. And then there was at the center of the complex, two chapels, a wooden one and a stone one linked by a half cloister. And thankfully for us, the stone one is still preserved at the heart of this wonderful Benedictine church. St John the Baptist that is now in the heart of Finkel Priory's great church. The church was built around the chapel and then the walls were taken down. Now this was in use for the last 30 years of Godric's life. It was his favourite place, his most sacred place and you can forgive him in his final years when he turned about 100 he asked for his bed to be brought just over here and he lived out his final years laid up against the north wall. Now, when he died, according to Reginald, they buried him, they put his tomb exactly where he'd laid for the last few years of his life. And it was actually found by archeologists in the 1920s. Now, it is way below ground level now, but it's marked on the ground by a simple cross. So what on earth would happen now? Would Godric's hermitage be deserted? Or would someone come and live here? Well, the answer lies all around us, doesn't it? And when we come back in part two, we're gonna be exploring this wonderful Benedictine priory. I'll see you later on in the show for more Rise and Fall of the Monasteries. place what a visit oh yes a county rich with history isn't it because yeah. it's just a stone's throw really from hadrian's wall sort of about 20 miles north of there and you're at hadrian's wall and it's because of as i yes this is the universal sign for scotland <laughs> i did laugh when i saw that we can now add that to <laughs> skein it up <laughs> scotland and you did one other the other day you did one for cross stitch Oh, was did. it this? Yeah, I think I did yes. do that. Well, this, that makes sense. This that is cross stitch. Yeah, oh, it yeah. does. It does. And skein it up sort of made sense. And had you been stood with me, that would have made sense for Scotland because it was behind you. Yeah. Or behind the camera, should I say. Still up so north. Yes. So much more to come, though, in the second half because, yes, we've got that wonderful Benedictine Priory to properly... Plopoly? 
Plop. properly <laughs> properly explore. And my goodness, the whole reason why Finkel was such an important part of this series is there's been lots of occasions where we've walked through total ruins. Mm. For example, if I take you to Jervo last time and we walked through the refectory and there was nothing mm. here, mm. there is virtually everything, mm. which is just tremendous. Yeah. So that's all to come in part two. Fabulous. Right now, though, it's time for me to say properly this time, Kate Jones, what's off your needles? I do have one thing off my needles. And this is an exciting thing. This is an exciting thing because this is the next platinum design that will be going out to all qualifying patrons on the 1st of June. Yes. Which is not long at all. It's not long at all at all. Yes. So this... Is your collection within a collection? It is. To go with your land of spells? No, this is the land of spells. Forget that. (laughs) It's all gone wrong. So this hat is the land of spells hat, which is inspired as the first design from this little collection within a collection was inspired. It's inspired by the Enid Blyton book, The Magic Faraway Tree. And within that book... They travel up the tree, through the clouds, and into the land of spells. So this hat is inspired by that, and it uses three mini skeins, which we're using these mini skeins all the way through these this little trilogy of patterns. So you just need three, just pick three of your mini skeins. skeins. Did I say skeins? I never say skeins. That was brilliant, that was brilliant. We're having a right show today. Here's the hat. So it uses the colour that I dyed. And doesn't it... It looks really stripy on camera. It does not look like that in reality. It's amazing how cameras pick up on things. It doesn't look like that at all. It just looks like a beautiful variegated... What yarn is that? ...tonal. That's the one I dyed. Right. Yeah, and then three of the minis. And it's got this lovely lace pattern in that's got that movement that looks like, oh, to me, I've interpreted it to be the clouds that they travel through to get to the land of spells. So there we go. It comes in two sizes. There's a medium large, which is this one, and then there's a small. So good options for all of your family, I would say. So this pattern, like I said, is going out on the 1st of June. I hope you enjoy it. And it's the second one in the collection, yes. within the collection. Yes. And for those of you, because there'll be people out there wanting, they'll be like chomping at the bit. When when can I complete my collection? Well, that's going to be in the... September. September, so the 1st of September. 1st of September, yes. the third pattern in that trilogy. And that's actually Columbia. the final pattern in this year's collection. Yes, because then... it goes over you know the advent design is the first one for the next yes yes as we discussed the other day it's a bit like the super bowl it's very confusing for me it's not the super bowl takes place in the year after the the season season. that is correct isn't it so this season for the just about to start it's the a 20, 2023 season, but they do the Super Bowl in 2024. That's correct. That's correct. It's all very confusing <sighs> for an ageing, allergy-ridden brain. A woman. <laughs> right. That's the lovely What's Off Your Needles. We always love a Platinum Collection launch, and we'll be talking a little bit about that in our pop show, which is coming up on Sunday, but we'll talk more about that in the Andy Bits. Right now, it's time for us to head back to Finkel and finish the story of just the most wonderful place, isn't it? and fall of the monasteries and this is the refectory now just picture the refectory that we saw when we were at Jervo. there was nothing just grass and here we've got absolutely everything which is just fascinating to see and the best part of all is we're actually on the floor that the monks would have eaten on 
This was the monks' dining hall, and as they walked into this space, they would have collected a spoon and a napkin. The top table, where the prior would have sat with his senior monks, would have been in front of us, and to our left and right the rest of the community sat on benches, with a long table in front facing inwards. As we discovered at Revo, the community sat in here, with the prior sat at the head of the room, and they would have eaten in silence, whilst listening to a member of their brethren read to them from a particularly appropriate book, perhaps one by St Ulred of Revo. And as this is the first refectory we've been able to get into this series properly and get on the floor that the monks ate on, I think it's only right that we have a little listen ourselves to one of Ulred's most successful works at Spiritual Friendship. And this is one of my favourite little extracts. Woe to the solitary, because when he falls, there's no one there to lift him up. How happy, how carefree, how joyful you are if you have a friend with whom you may talk as freely as with yourself, to whom you neither fear to confess any fault nor blush at revealing any spiritual progress, to whom you may entrust all the secrets of your heart and confide all your plans. And what is more delightful than so to unite spirit to spirit and so to make one out of two? But who were this community of monks at Finkel Priory? Well, in the years following Godric's death, his tomb became a place of pilgrimage for Christians from all across Europe. And the, the land had initially been donated to Godric by the Benedictine monks of Durham Cathedral. And so it was decided that the best way to pay homage to Godric's memory and also to look after the many pilgrims who were coming here to visit his tomb was to build this wonderful little Benedictine priory. Everything that you would expect to find here is here, like this small chapter house. And every day the community would meet here to listen to a chapter from the rule of St. Benedict read aloud. They would also deal with any priory affairs and deal with matters of discipline. Because Finkel was so small, it was a priory which, as we found out earlier in the episode, was ruled by a prior. The first man to sit at the head of the community here was Prior Thomas. Now, whilst this is a priory and not an abbey like everything we visited so far in this series, it still lived by the rule of St. Benedict. And what sits at the heart of the rule of St. Benedict? The Abbey Church. Let's go take a look. As always, we start our tour of the church at the West End. This was the main entrance into the nave. Now Finkel did have a small lay community and this is where they would come whenever the bell tolled for services. As we walk into the church itself, we're greeted with wonderful sections of its original flooring, dating from around 1260 AD. As we discovered at Revo, and is evident in most monasteries, either side of the entrance are burials of rich patrons. The layout of the nave is exactly what we've seen on previous visits just a little bit smaller. There would have been stalls on either side of me as I walked down the nave. And this is where the community would have sat for services. And at the head of the nave, there would have been an altar.
The altar in the nave would have been around about here, and archaeologists have deduced that it must have been raised due to the height of this sink and cupboard, used to wash and store cups needed during communion. As we leave the altar and the nave behind, we pass under what was once a great tower. Now, it was actually standing for many years after Finkel closed, but unfortunately it collapsed in the 17th century. Finally, we end in the choir, which as we have discovered already in the series, was separated off from the rest of the church with wooden screens. Beneath the east window before us would have laid the high altar. And set into the walls of the choir, is this sedia. Now you'll see these in churches all over the world. And these actually date from 1260 AD. These are the seats which the priests would sit at during services when they weren't up at the high altar. Now these date from 1260 AD, which is just wonderful. And also they're sat in the heart of the church, the presbytery. And what I love about the presbytery here at Finkel is the presbytery is Godric's original St. John the Baptist Chapel. There is though something strange going on at Finkel Priory, because in all the sites that we've visited so far, we've seen expansion. But here at Finkel, we see quite the opposite. It's retraction. Just take a look at this. We're looking at the side walls of the nave and can you see those pillars? They were once arches and they've been blocked up. When this place opened, it was like Jervo, Byland and Revo. It had a central area flanked by vaulted aisles. This southern aisle has actually become part of the cloister. It's a very inventive solution, but what's going on here? Well, the answer lies in the history books because in the late 13th century and the early 14th century, we're entering into the time of the Scottish Wars of Independence. This is a time where characters like William Wallace and Robert the Bruce were first and foremost. And this part of the world became like a war zone. And so rich patrons and pilgrims coming to visit Godric's tomb were in very short supply. As the choir monks worked here in the day room, it must have felt like the enemy was at the gates. The marauding Scottish armies potentially, you know, waiting to come and, and take over the priory and your patrons have long since disappeared. It must have been really quite terrifying. We're walking through the day room at Finkel. It's slightly smaller than what we saw at Revo, but it's still impressive. Beneath each barrel vault sat a desk that in the winter, and when it rained, was used by the community. Monks spent a huge amount of time creating texts as books were rare. All read spiritual friendship might be copied for the Priory Library, or the prize account rolls and history might be being written. A brazier hung above each desk for light, and fires around the room kept the community warm. For 70 years, this really fascinating space had been a hive of activity. But now, as the money was drying up, a decision needed to be made as how best to move forward. And the man who would do that was the prior.
And this is where you would find him. Home first to Thomas and then to 51 further priors. The prior filled the role of the abbot here at Finkel. And so it was his job in this space, and it was quite a grand house really, but in this space on the floor above here, it was the prior's job to entertain potential donors that would bring in the money that would keep this whole community afloat. And this is the space he would have done that in. It's the Prior's Hall, perfect for entertaining and impressing guests. But as the Scottish Wars of Independence heated up and the patrons disappeared, something very interesting happened. We've left the Prior's Hall behind and we're actually up on the level that the Prior would have entertained his guests on that's missing. It's what those bollards used to hold up that we were just exploring. Now, we're on this same level because extensive archaeological work has been done across the site at Finkel, but particularly in this area, when combined with the historical records, it starts to give us a clear picture on what was going on, because I'm stood in a kitchen and this shouldn't be here. Now, the question is, why was it installed? Well, this kitchen was put here at the same time that those aisles were blocked up in the church. And there were other things done as well to just restrict the size of the buildings a little bit. Now, the reason why the buildings had been restricted in size is because it's evident that there were only four permanent guests, well, they're not guests, four monks living here, and there were as well four guests. So instead of having a community of between 15 and 20, suddenly there's only eight people here. Finkel had become a holiday destination for the monks of Durham Cathedral. It was a very inventive solution because by halving the size of the community, it halved the outlay. And so Finkel's future was secure. And we actually have the original rules that were set out for the holiday place laid down by Durham Cathedral because they still hold the records of Finkel Priory to this day. A prior and four monks will live at Finkel permanently, joined every three weeks by a further four monks from Durham. On alternate days, two of the four holidaying monks are to attend the usual round of services, while the other two, having attended Mass and Vespers, have leave to walk religiously and honestly in the fields. The problem is, it's sort of human nature, isn't it? That if we're given an inch, we want to take a mile. And that's what happened. Records show that Finkel monks were accused and were guilty of attending hunting meets and also keeping sporting dogs. What would St. Allred of Revo, Roger of Byland, and Godric himself think of that? The behaviours, just the seeds of the behaviours, which would be used by Henry VIII at the dissolution of the monasteries, were just starting to appear at this point. All that said, Finkel as a holiday place lasted for 200 years, and the position of prior of Finkel was one of the most sought after of all the, the sort of promotions that the monks of Durham Cathedral could aspire to. And I have to say, I'm not remotely surprised because this place is just gorgeous. So our story of Finkel Priory comes to an end. A fascinating place that was founded by a hermit, which became a Benedictine priory and finished a holiday place. Known to St. Ulred of Revo and the Pope himself, 
Whilst Finkel might be small, its reputation rests squarely on the shoulders of the man who first settled here. Godric chose the site of his forever home well, didn't he? And I think Finkel is very much like Godric himself, because no matter what the world threw at this place, it found a way to keep going, just like Godric did until he was 105 years old. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time for more Rise and Fall of the Monasteries. Call a history documentary. Genghis oh, Khan. Genghis Khan. Evil King John. Yes. A pirate. Amazing. A wonderful Benedictine priory. My favourite bit of the whole thing is that he's still there. I know, it's lovely. Isn't that Found just his so tomb. lovely? Under the ground. And it's just that simple cross. It's just marked with that simple cross. And I th- and that follows on from last time when you said that they didn't like gravestones as such. No. So it follows on from that, doesn't it? And I yeah. just think that's just amazing. He's, you know, he's lying in the spot What's where cool, though, is the he fact lived, that and I think that's just fantastic. In the church, you know, he was there the whole time while all the Benedictine monks were in there doing their business because they built the church around him. Mm. So, you know, he's, he's there under the floor and, you know, the place which he'd founded, he was there the whole time. And, you know, as, as we looked at when we were walking through the church just there in, in part two it's sort of lovely that the most sacred part of the church the presbytery is actually right where his mm. first chapel mm. was where he's buried mm. Mm. so it is it's just it's lovely all round but also as well okay. amazing that all red he gets everywhere all red he does doesn't he I mean, yeah. just what a character he must have been and so many characters yeah and I love that it ended up as like a little holiday holiday area I know. You know holiday retreat well I mean that's just a fantastic for not even you know for a long time it was that wasn't it f- fantastic but also it really shows you that the worm is starting to turn the golden yeah. age of the monastery yeah. is just starting to pass and it's just human nature as I said in the show you know when you get given an inch you mm. think oh I'll just have maybe mm. another inch mm. and before you know it you've taken a mile and that's the story that we're going to start to chart now in the final four episodes of mm. the series mm. as things just start to tip over the edge and head towards the dissolution which is a, I mean I think I could make it mm. a series about the dissolution on its own yeah. and I've got to fit that story into one episode <laughs> look that's enough of the rise and fall of the monasteries it'll be back yes not next time, because time next after. time, oh yes, it's time for the return yes, of my favourite blanket. It and is. I am loving seeing this grow through the year. There's something, I think there's something so special about a project which runs through a year. Yeah. Because it absolutely. makes the year so memorable. It does, it does. Absolutely, it does. And I know that when. Knitting, we get to completion. You're knitting memories into the blanket, aren't you? That was the cross stitch action. Oh, sorry, I did the wrong thing. Uh, I'm not sti- we're not did cross the, stitching. You're it. knitting. <laughs> oh yeah, we don't have a knitting one. It, oh no, what are you doing? <laughs> That's not how you knit. You can't remember how to knit. Dan can't remember how to knit now. I need needles. <laughs> he can't do yeah. fake knitting, oh, no. clearly. That's a good thing. Yeah, well, that is a good thing. Yes. Look, this time for the endy bits. Yes, endy bits. Oh, yes. Now, look, over the last two episodes of our radio show, we've gone coronation crazy. Yes. We've got ready for the coronation, and then we've given you our coronation review. Yeah. But now all that's behind us as we get into some really great suggestions which you've sent mm. us. And we've got another two episode series coming up. In the first episode, we're going to be talking about our, we're going to try and give you our top 10 literary heroes oh, of, yes. of stage or book. Yeah, book or screen. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> or stage. I went all theatrical. Yeah. So we'll try and give you our top ten. I say we'll try because we tend to talk quite a lot in a radio show. Yeah. Sometimes we don't get to ten. I don't know if we'll get to ten. But you'll certain, or you'll, you may get more than ten. You'll who get, knows? You'll get a few. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> but you'll certainly find out who our yeah. top literary heroes are. And in the episode after that, and I think secretly I might be looking forward to this one even more, we're going to give you our top villains. Yes, villains. Of Scream and Page. Oh, yes. Yes. It's going to be marvellous. I've got one thing I wanted to tell you about, and it's a little tale of extreme woe, right? And frustration. And frustration. Do you remember this pair of socks that I knit down recently? You do remember, don't you? The Trekking XXL. I know it led to you knacking your hand. It destroyed my hand. I had to... That's how I took up cross stitch because of these socks. So because, actually, we should thank these should socks thank, thank for the, the beach socks. day's cross stitch. That's no, probably true. <laughs> Fate. Yes, but in any case, I'd hoarded this yarn for literally years because I just loved it so much and it was precious. And you know how you do these things. Finally, it knitted up into this lovely pair of socks for Dan. He's worn them a few times. They've maybe been in the wash. Three times, maybe? Just went into my normal rotation. Yeah. I've not, you know... It's not that long ago that I finished these. I haven't worn them walking or anything. No. So it's not like... And, you know, if you look at the heel, no, not really very much wear. Not a problem. And I was putting them on the... They came out of the washer the other day, and I washed them only on 30 degrees, short cycle, cool, you know. And all socks go through like that. All. Does, and yeah, none of them have a problem. No, no. So... And this pair I was putting over the clothes area because they don't go in the dryer and I noticed something and it's on both socks and I was just like, you're kidding me. So this is on like the ball of Dan's foot. You are having a laugh. Can you see that? It's gone through. You can see that, can't you? That is the fastest I've ever gone through a pair of socks. It's the fastest a pair of socks has ever gone through and it's not just one sock, it's both socks on the ball of his foot. Which... That will get some abuse because that's probably the bit that hits. Yeah, but every other pair of your socks has never done this. <laughs> it's fine. So, you know, you do... If, if Dan had never worn a pair of hand-knitted socks before and this was the first pair, I'd be like, well, maybe it's your feet. Yeah, yeah. But he wears hand-knitted socks every single day. Yeah. And they all go through the same rotation. They yeah. all go through the same process. Yeah. Not one of them has this happened to this quickly. And it's so, you know, they're not wearable currently because that would be a hole in three seconds. It virtually is a hole now, you yeah, saw. Yeah. And yes, I could darn these, but I just unfortunately don't have the time right now to spend darning them because there'd be no point darning them in the same yarn. I think I do have a tiny bit left. But there'd be no point, would there? Because clearly the yarn yeah, is the issue. Yeah. I'd have to darn them with something oh, yeah. else. Yeah. And also, because it's on the ball of your foot, I feel like you'd be able to feel that darn because yeah. you'd be walking on it, wouldn't you? So I'm not sure. I probably won't get round to darning don't them. Don't buy this honesty. yarn, folks. Or don't knit socks well, with it. Well, it's designed for socks, isn't it? Yeah. I'm really shocked. I'm really shocked that this has happened to this yarn. It's the Trekking XXL. Yes, it was an old skein out of my stash, but I've used old skeins of like Opal and Regia before and never had a problem. No. And, you know, the whole rest of the sock is fine. It'd be a bit weird if we've got to start putting a use-by date on yarn. Yeah, I know. I obviously loved this yarn at the time. If you remember, I, you know, I went on and on about it and that's, I think that's why it's so disappointing that it's kind of let me down. When well, it's let you down. a lot of work went into these socks. It's let you down on so that, many levels. That ribbed element in it. So they just took such a long time and caused me so much pain yeah. to my hand, if you remember. It's fine now, yeah. but... Ooh, Stay away from that. That was not a happy oh, yes. moment. The summer of stitching. It's in full flow, of course. It absolutely is. And we've had some completed beachcomber socks already. We have. There's only one part of the beachcomber socks course left. Right. But then it gets really cool because then we get into the beach days. Yes. And we're going to be talking about this in our pop show on Sunday, which I'll tell you about in just a second. But the very first episode of the beach days cross stitch tutorial, it is like a beginner's guide in one video. It's 29 minutes long. Is it? But what we've done is we've put chapter markers on that video. Right. So that you can easily skip to the things that you... So you might look down the chapter and think, well, I know that, I know that, I know that, but I don't know that. Yeah. So you can jump yeah. straight to the things you want. We wanted to produce 
a one-stop shop. Yeah. You know, okay, I need to do this. Bang, there I am. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm I, I think as I was filming it, I just kept thinking of more and more things I wanted to say. So. Yeah. So it's all chopped up beautifully for you, so you can ask things you want. But it's a brilliant resource, and that. That, it's the 20th, the 20th of June that starts. Before that, actually, between the end of the Beachcomber Socks and the start of the Beach Days, we've got some Summer of Stitching reviews on the way. Yes. One from the wonderful Jen Keeler, yes. our knitability editor. So that's going to be really exciting. So lots going on there. The pop show, which I mentioned, so the patron exclusive show, it's on Sunday the 28th of May. This Sunday. 2023. Yeah. You can watch it live at 2 p.m. British Summer Time if you are a silver, gold or platinum Baker Bear patron. Yeah. And anybody, any patron at all, can watch the show from 3.10 afterwards, any time they like. Yeah. So from 10 past 3, the show will just be there. So you can come and watch it whenever you want to watch it. And it's definitely going to be worth a watch because Kay's going to be talking self-striping yarn. Yeah. I'm going to be talking handspun. Yeah. We'll also be doing lots of other lovely things. Yeah. So don't miss that. Yes, absolutely. It's time to say goodbye. Oh, yes. yes. It's been wonderful to see you. Thank you so it much has. for watching. It has. Don't miss our patron only show coming on Sunday. Yep. It's going to be marvellous. Summer of Stitching is continuing all it the way is. through. Yes. And then, of course, we will be back in two weeks with a brand new video show featuring yes. my favourite blanket. Yeah. We'll see you then. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.